Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. But your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Well, these certainly are peculiar times, aren't they? A few days ago, President Donald Trump announced that the country is on a certain wartime footing. Recently, major manufacturers here in Michigan, like Ford, announced that they were retooling their plants to make medical supplies, just like they once retooled their plants to make tanks and airplanes uh, nearly 80 years ago for World War II. Uh, International borders have been shut, and as of this moment, nearly one quarter of America's population is now basically living at home under lockdown in order to prevent the spread of this disease. We Christians may well wonder, in the face of all of this, what is God up to? We believe that God is benevolent, that He's good, that He rules this world, and so we have to ask, uh, is He in charge of any of this? How do we square his loving mercy with what we are witnessing? Where is God in the midst of this suffering? Now, I think we need to be very careful how we approach this question as Christians. On the one hand, the scriptures are very honest about the reality of human pain, human suffering. Uh, They don't skirt over it or dance around it. You might even say that the reality of human suffering is the single most important thing driving the narrative of salvation forward. But on the other hand, uh, Scripture is, um, uh, does not dance around this issue with faint platitudes or naive notions. The Scriptures are equally clear that our current sufferings are the inevitable result of living in a fallen world, a world which groans, a world which groans under a curse that is brought about, let us be clear, by our own rebellion against God. So what are God's people to do? in the midst of all of this. Psalm 30 actually offers us perhaps a startling answer. It opens with praise, which I suppose is an appropriate antidote to what may be a temptation now to despair. I will magnify you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. O Lord, my God, I cry to you, you have made me whole, the psalmist says. The psalmist then continues to describe his current predicament in relatively relatable terms. He describes in verse 6 that complacency which so easily besets all of us in times of prosperity. He says, in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. You, O Lord, of your goodness have made my hill strong. Isn't this how it often feels like? He's given uh, the divine a place for his current prosperity. But then something changes. What happens when times get tough, when things get bad? I'm mindful of the story of Job and how he says to his friends that uh, should we accept good from God and not the evil? When things get difficult, can we still give our God thanks and praise? The psalmist here seems to understand the problem just as he gave the divine a place for his good fortune, so he also seems to give it a place for his bad. He says in verse 7, you turned your face from me, and I was distressed. It was God himself who seems to be responsible 
at least by his very absence. And isn't that how it usually feels? That God is present with us in our good times, but he's absent in our bad. But notice what the psalmist does. Notice how he makes our problem God's problem. In verse 10, he says, Shall the dust give thanks to you, or shall it declare your faithfulness? What profit is there in my bloodshed if I go down into the pit? There's a simple logic here. God deserves to be praised by his creatures. He is a good, a benevolent, an almighty, and all-wise creator. It is fitting that he should receive our praise. And if we go down into the pit, if the works of his hands cease to exist, he himself does not receive his proper due. There's an audacity in this kind of declaration. The psalmist makes our problem God's problem. He seems to suggest that God's own prerogative as God requires him to act to defend us, his creature. God's own glory is at stake in our suffering. You might think this thought impious. It might even seem blasphemous on its face, but counterintuitively, God himself seems to agree. He says, you have turned my lamentation into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. God has heard the logic of this complaint and has acted to deliver. Now, we as Christians ought to know far better than the psalmist, for we have seen how personally invested God is in our suffering. We have seen his glory shine in the face of his son, Jesus Christ, who was born a servant like us, who died the death that is our due. He rose to new life, glorious new life, that we might have hope in him. We have seen how God cares in the life of Jesus. The logic of the season of Lent is that we approach the cross of Jesus Christ in this season. And I am mindful of a prayer in my own tradition which says this, Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Notice the logical sequence of this. So the prayer goes on. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than life and peace. How can we be so sure of this kind of redemption, that our suffering will be turned to joy? Because we've seen in the life of Jesus Christ that there's no profit for God and our being downfallen. The world will know that he is a good creator that he is a powerful redeemer. The world will see it. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bend. His own glory is at stake. He will see it done. As we enter more fully into this Lenten season, let us remember God's own personal investment in our hardships. He is capable of turning our suffering into joy if we humbly go to him and call out to him, as the psalmist himself models for us in verse 8 of this psalm. May we follow his lead now.